Well, thank you, Joe, and thank you, Leo, and uh, the unions and organizations which put together this conference. Uh, we, we are engaged uh, in a struggle, and a very important part of that struggle is ideological. And Joe has just laid out some of the history of that ideological struggle. So this is a battle of ideas, and I think that's why this conference is, is so important. Uh, I want to start really by taking a moment of personal privilege to say how happy I am to be standing up here not only with uh, the two people to my immediate left, but also with Lee. Uh, Lee and I joined the labor movement about the same time uh, in the early 1980s, right at the end of the great surge of public sector organizing. And we were two young idealists at that time who often sat around and criticized the complacency of union leaders who were already looking at three decades of declining density, particularly in the private sector. Uh, so it's, it's really wonderful to be up here with Lee, because one thing you can certainly say about Lee uh, is that he is not complacent in the face of our current challenges. So thank you for, for putting this panel together. So as Joe has described, uh, the current attack has a long pedigree. Um, but what I want to describe is the difference today. Uh, so uh, from the two decades between 59 and 82 where you had the great surge of organizing uh, coupled with the passage of the laws which you see uh, laid out in the diagram which we've circulated, uh, the attacks were really cyclical up until the Great Recession. So we all know of course that government, particularly state and local government, is a labor intensive enterprise. Uh, most of the costs of state and local government are payroll costs. The largest non-fixed cost is labor. And so with every recession, there's al almost an immediate attack uh, on public sector workers. Uh, but previously, that attack was different, different in kind. That is, if you look back at the legal work we've done during recessions over the last 30 years, it's typically been an attack on the bargain, right? So most of our work has been under the contracts clause. You have a recession, and the public uh, employers attempted to undo the bargain renege on the commitments they'd made, and the litigation would be under the contracts clause. Uh, never before have we seen recession lead to an attack on the basic structure, on the basic structure of collective bargaining uh, in state and local government. Uh, and that's what's different now. That's what's different about the response to the Great Recession. Now, there's many reasons for that. Uh, I think the most essential reason is the decline in density in the private sector. Uh, which has left the public sector as an island in a non-union sea in places like Wisconsin. But I want to focus on two men, the importance of two men uh, following uh, what Joe has done. You all know the Scott Walker story. Uh, he's one of the men, and I'm not going to tell that story. I want to focus on another man, and that's Justice Samuel Alito. So the story begins, of course, in Wisconsin in 1959, uh, when that state enacted the first comprehensive pu public sector collective bargaining law. And that law, like all the subsequent laws throughout the blue states, paralleled the provisions of the National Labor Relations Act and the Railway Labor Act, which governed the private sector. And they have the following essential provisions. Majority rule. You have an election, the majority rules. Exclusive representation. The representative that's elected represents everybody, whether they're a union member or a non-member. And they have a legal duty to represent union member and non-member. Uh, and therefore, the ability to counter what would, what would otherwise be the free rider problem. Union has a duty to represent you whether you're a member or not, and therefore you have an incentive to be a free rider, and union can counter that by agreeing that everyone will share the cost in a so-called agency or fair share fee. Those are the bedrock principles of labor relations in this country since 1935. And the Supreme Court has upheld that, well, Congress has upheld it in the Taft-Hartley Act in 1947. That is, Taft-Hartley did many things, uh, but it left that bedrock principle standing, that the cost of representation could be spread across everyone who benefits. The Supreme Court has upheld that principle in the private sector numerous times, 56, 61, 63, 88. But in the mid-1970s, uh, at, at the tail end of the expansion of public sector collective bargaining, Sylvester Petro who Joe has described to you, uh, decided to challenge the application of that principle in the public sector. And he said, as Joe has, has described, that public sector bargaining was different. And he brought a case which became a Bood versus Detroit uh, Board of Education, decided in 1977, and argued in the Supreme Court that although those principles may apply in the private sector, in the public sector they were unconstitutional. 
And he wrote a 216-page brief. The brief is alleged to have led the court to adopt for the first time a page limitation on briefing. And in that briefing, he said the following, and I'm going to quote at length. He said, the majority in this case, that is, the majority who elected the union, has used the power of the state in a particularly repugnant way. It has not been content to impose its will upon the disabled, in, excuse me, upon the dissident individuals, to compel them to yield to the majority their fundamental right to make their own employment contracts. Not satisfied with suppression so egregious, the majority has insisted that the oppressed individuals also be made to pay for the pains and penalties imposed on them. And the state of Michigan has authorized this extortionate process. Not even the chattel slaves before emancipation were compelled to pay for the dubious privilege of having their employment relationship controlled by someone else. But there is more. The oppression here, like oppression everywhere, serves no valid public interest. On the contrary, when the financial means ex exacted from the, dissent, from the dissenting minority, the aggressive majority will strengthen its economic and political position and thus enhance its power to hold the community at ransom. Let Baltimore burn. At ransom, whenever the taxpayer resists its demands, the non-conforming individuals are the immediate target of the ambitious majority, but the community will be the ultimate victim if no check is placed upon the authority of the state to enable the aggressors in this case to wax invincibly strong by the exercise of the special privilege. So stripped of the rhetoric, what is he saying? He's saying three things. He's saying one, that the compelled association, which is inherent in majority rule of course, is different in the public sector because bargaining as Joe said is inherently political in the public sector. Right? It's no different than requiring people to contribute to the Democratic Party and not the Republican Party. That's the argument. But he's saying something else. He's saying, two, uh, the state is different from a private employer because it's not constrained by the market. There's no market check, and therefore this invincible power of the union uh, is going to remain unchecked. And thirdly, uh, he's saying there's also something different in the public sector because people already have rights as citizens. So these trade unionists are going to use their rights as citizen to essentially influence who they're going to be bargaining with. So they're going to take this money, they're going to bargain with a public employer not checked by the market, they're going to use their power as citizens to influence who the public employer puts on the other side of the table, and then they're going to let Baltimore burn as a result. Those are the central legal arguments that were made. In a unanimous decision in 1977, the court rejected Petro's argument in Abood versus Detroit Board of Education. They said whatever forced association is involved in countering this free rider problem by allowing a collection of fair share fees uh, is, and I quote, constitutionally justified by the legislative assessment of the important contribution of the union shop to the system of labor relations in the public sector just as in the private sector. Public employees, the court said, are not basically different from private employees. But the court found there was a distinction between politics and collective bargaining. Right? And they said the union could not use the fees for political purposes. Right? The First Amendment, the court said, prohibits the union from requiring any employee to contribute to the support of an ideological cause he may be opposed to as a condition of holding his job as a public school teacher in that case. But that's different from supporting activities germane to the union's legal duties as a collective bargaining representative. That's notable that this was not the Warren Court. This was not the Warren Court in 1977. In fact, the Chief Justice had retired in 1969. This was the Burger Court. This was a court with six of nine justices appointed by Republican presidents, and they unanimously upheld this principle. In subsequently, uh, this case of Boot has been cited 897 times by the federal courts, including 38 times in the high court alone. Justice Scalia, no great friend of labor, said in 1991, and I quote, where the state imposes upon the, duty, upon the union a duty to deliver services, it may permit the union to demand reimbursement for them. So Justice Scalia has joined in upholding this principle numerous times. And the board is not, excuse me, the board. The court has detailed the line between politics on the one hand and bargaining on the other, and in fact imposed a duty on unions in the public sector to adopt a process to allow employees to help to police that line and to ensure that the fees that they pay are used only for collective bargaining and for related purposes. Just last year, Justice Kagan observed for, over, for uh, nearly four decades, we have cited Abood favorably numerous times 
and we have repeatedly affirmed and applied its core distinction between the costs of collective bargaining and those of political activities. So for four decades, the court has accepted this dichotomy and affirmed a boot. Uh, and even the most right-wing critics of collective bargaining, the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation, for example, have not questioned a boot uh, until 2012. And in, interestingly, the advocate or the entity or the person who questioned a boot was not actually an advocate for the, in the first instance, but was a justice of the Supreme Court and that's Justice Alito. So how did this happen? Uh, Justice Alito began to question Abood in a little known case called Knox versus Service Employees International Union. And what was actually at issue in that case had nothing to do with Abood, but had to do with the process uh, which unions are required to go through to allow employees to challenge that division between political activities and collective bargaining. But in the course of deciding that case, or that question, uh, Justice Alito began to question the precedent of Abood. He called it unusual, he called it extraordinary uh, in that case, even though no advocate had questioned Abood in the case. Justice Sotomayor explained in her concurring opinion that Justice Alito's opinion, quote, addressed issues well outside the scope of the questions presented in brief, breaks with this court's own rules, and more importantly, disregards the principles of judicial restraint. Uh, meanwhile, while that case was proceeding up to the Supreme Court, the National Right to Work Committee had another case pending uh, called Harris versus Quinn. And what was initially involved in Harris versus Quinn was the extension of Illinois' collective bargaining law to cover state-paid home care, home care workers. And in that case, Right to Work did not question Abood initially. Rather, they said, well, Abood may apply in the ordinary context, but in the context of home care, uh, the state doesn't control all the terms and conditions because customers retain some authority to hire, fire, and to some extent supervise, and therefore the state's interest in collective bargaining is lessened, and therefore uh, the infringement on freedom of association is not justified. Now, that law and others like it, of course, led to the largest surge of union organizing since the passage of these collective bargaining laws, with close to a million home care workers being organized from California to Massachusetts. Uh, when the case was decided, again unanimously, by the Court of Appeals with the decision issued by a Republican judge appointed by President Ronald Reagan, that was the issue and the court said unanimously, uh, Abood applies, uh, these are public employees and they have a right to engage in collective bargaining. But what happened in between the time the case was decided by the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court is that earlier case, Knox, was decided and Justice Alito began to criticize Abood. And so when the case got to the Supreme Court, Right to Work broadened its argument and mounted a frontal assault on Abood. Now Justice Alito at that time did not take on Abood again, right? Rather, he limited its application and said, yes, National Right to Work Committee, you're right. It doesn't apply to those who are not, as he called them, full-fledged public employees. In other words, he said that this central principle of labor relations couldn't apply to home care workers. In that context, essentially, union members have to pay the cost of representing non-members. But he continued in, in uh, Justice Kagan's words to, quote, take pot shots at Abood. He, called, he said that Abood Court's analysis is questionable on several grounds, which happened as a result uh, in court and outside court uh, is that his hints about what he'd like to do with the boot have had serious consequences. So in court, advocates are essentially in a race to get back to the court uh, to ask the court to overturn a boot. Uh, at the head of the race is a case called Friedrichs versus California Teachers Association, which is actually pending at the court right now on a petition for cert asking the court to take the case. Now this is an unusual case because in this case, the lawyers representing the dissident California teachers actually asked in the district court that the court rule against them. And in the Court of Appeals, again, they asked, please rule against us as quickly as possible so we can get to the Supreme Court. So they acknowledged they were wrong on the law. They wanted to give Justice Alito another chance. Now that case is pending right now. We don't know exactly when the court uh, will decide what, what it will do, but it's possible they could take the case before they recess for the summer, which would have it argued uh, next fall and decided as early as the new year. Uh, if the court overturns a boot, what's the consequence? The consequence is essentially taking the principle of right to work from those states which have adopted right to work laws in the private sector and it, 
making it a constitutional principle applying throughout the public sector. Right? That is taking that financial linchpin of a system of minority rule and pulling it out throughout the public sector. There's many cases following behind uh, uh, Friedrichs should the court decide not to take the case. So let me just say two other things. One, uh, what Justice Alito has done has not only had consequences in court and may not only have consequences in court next term, uh, but has, co has had consequences outside the court. So for example, in Illinois, uh, Governor Rauner uh, in February issued an executive order indicating that he would not comply with contracts and he would order his agencies not to uh, comply with contracts and with state law, uh, allowing collection of so-called fair share fees. Uh, and he said in his executive order, um, uh, and I quote, in Harris, a majority of the Supreme Court questioned the legal and factual basis of Abood's ruling and the aforementioned uh, criticism of Abood leave no doubt that the First Amendment, uh, uh, that, that collection of fair share fees is unconstitutional under the First Amendment. In other words, he was saying, I don't care what existing law is and what we've agreed to in contracts and what state law says, and I don't care what the existing state of the law is in the Supreme Court. Uh, these hints dropped by Justice Alito allow me to break the law. Now, he subsequently agreed to a temporary restraining order, uh, and fees are being collected and paid to the unions. Uh, but you see the consequences of what a single justice has done in this series of cases and what might happen next term. Uh, let me just say one last thing. What's the, what's the underlying premise of what's going on here? The underlying premise uh, is that the state should do nothing uh, to further the organization of working people. Right? That's, that's Petro's critique. That's what's being argued to Justice Alito, and that's what he's hinting the Supreme Court might uphold that the state should do nothing to further the organization of working people. That's why state legislatures throughout the red states are trying to uh, delete provisions and statutes which allow dues deduction, for example. That the state should do nothing uh, to further the representation of working people. Now that's an odd premise if you start from the foundational law uh, which led to all these statutes, the National Labor Relations Act, which says it's the policy of the United States to encourage the practice and procedures of collective bargaining and protect the exercises of workers of full freedom of association. Right? So it's our challenge to once again convince people of good faith that encouraging organization and encouraging collective bargaining serves the common good, not only in the private sector, but in the public sector. Thank you. Thank you.